Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here as part of this Blue Waters Symposium and uh, talk about some of the research I've been doing at the University of Illinois and now at the Colorado School of Mines with uh, a lot of my, my colleagues. And I should start off by acknowledging those colleagues. First of all, the support from Blue Waters to have access to this real state-of-the-art computer. Um, secondly, my, my co-PIs at the University of Illinois, my uh, co-author of this paper, Dr. Shemak Cho, who um, did the um, fluent simulations. My uh, other PhD student who's worked on an in-house code. Um, several other uh, students. My uh, collaborator, Patap Vanka, who is uh, a professor who is, uh, works on the GPU implementation of uh, CFD uh, on, on Blue Waters and on our lab computers. Uh, ANSYS for providing the Fluent software for us to run on Blue Waters, which requires a lot of licenses in addition to getting support. And my co-PI is at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications who work on the, the, uh, the fluid flow and also stress analysis. And then finally, the sponsors of the research, which are 10 companies from the steel industry. So um, we are, uh, as objectives, the overall objectives are to find ways to improve the continuous casting process so that we can make steel better and the companies will have something to show for their investment in these simulations. Um, just a little bit of background. Uh, steel uh, continuous casting is the process used to manufacture 95% of the steel in the world. It's about 1.4 billion tons per year. And uh, it, it, it involves taking the molten metal in a ladle. It goes through a ton dish where it uh, flows down through a nozzle into a water-cooled bottomless copper mold. It freezes a thin shell against the mold. And then this is withdrawn by drive rolls that pull the shell down through the caster while it's being spray cooled from the outside. And eventually, the whole thing becomes solid, and then and you cut it to length you'd like, and then roll it to make, for example, sheets for car bodies or refrigerators or bars for beams in buildings. As I said, 95% of the world's steel goes through this machine. So it makes sense to understand how it operates exactly and how to improve it. And it's not easy to see what's happening in the molten steel. This very harsh environment makes it ideal for computational models to give us new insights. But the phenomena are very complex. We've got turbulent multi-phase flow of this um, molten steel coming in. It's got a slag glare on top, and that slag glare insulates it, but if the slag gets entrapped, we end up with defects, and that's one of the things we like to stop. There's some tricky surface tension issues. There's heat transfer solidification as the shell solidifies against the mold wall. Um, we have to worry about any particles that get trapped um, into the fluid. Where do they go? So we want the transport and removal of those particles. There are a lot of other different factors, and one of those is the application of electromagnetic fields. We can put a field over top of the molten steel, and being a conductor, that will create a Lorentz force that changes the flow pattern. And this can help to optimize the fluid flow if we can understand it. So that's the objective of, of this work. Um, but just understanding it isn't enough. We have to solve defects. So for example, the steady state flow pattern isn't the main thing we want to know. We're interested in transient fluctuations of this surface level, which can then trap particles on the side and give you surface defects. So we're also interested in gas, which is injected. These gas bubbles flow, and they prevent nozzle clogging, which is a good thing. But if these gas bubbles are trapped in the product, then they create defects. It's very bad. The top surface can freeze, and the profile can change. And that's another source of defects that we'd like to solve. So why blue waters? We have a lot of need for an accurate fluid flow prediction. And using high resolution grids and uh, large eddy simulation is one of the best tools to uh, investigate the fluid flow. And we really um, have a, a breakthrough in speed in computing using these kinds of systems. 
We're using both commercial software, the Fluent Package from ANSYS, and our own in-house CU Flow program, which is a multi-GPU code. Uh, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the equations we're solving. We've got the large eddy simulations, which is aiming for direct numerical simulation, but we have the uh, uh, subgrid scale model just for, for safety in case our grid is not quite fine enough. We usually start the program with a regular RAND solver at steady state in order to initiate our, our um, transient simulations. We also have second phase models, the volume of fluid method, and we, we want to track the slag and the steel so we can get the interface motion. And then finally, discrete particle models for the motion of those particles once they're entrapped. Of course, we need the magnetohydrodynamics equations for the magnetic field effects. And then we need a model for the capture of the particles. So there are a lot of equations that go with that. A little bit about CU flow. It's, uh, there's several different versions of it. It can run on a CPU, or it can run on multi-GPUs, or it can run on the Blue Waters configuration, which is the CPU and GPU together. And this is where my, my collaborators have figured out how to do this, and it, and it was not easy to get all those algorithms to, to optimize with going back and forth with the memory. But they were successful, and we're seeing that uh, it, now we, we can do in two days, we can do a 30-second simulation. Um, it used to be I had a graduate student a few years ago who for his master's did two simulations, high fidelity simulations that matched measurements, so they were really good. But each one of them took him about six months. That's all he did for his PhD. Um, so now we can do these things a lot faster. So it's a, this, this is the sort of breakthrough that really enables some of the future um, advances. But our CU flow program, if we want any physics in that, we have to put it in ourselves. If you look at a commercial package like Fluent, it comes with a lot of physics already built in, except that getting it to run on a supercomputer like Blue Waters is a project. So we've tried to do that as well. And we're able to get uh, a speed up of 3,000 times relative to our, our lab computer. Um, and that was for a grid of 22 million cells. So it turns out if you've got more cells and you, you can get them to have the load partitioning well, then you, you can actually get some very good speed ups. And this has really enabled us to do a lot more work than, than we could have before. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the results we've, we've obtained from four different projects, just to give you a flavor for what we're doing with the tools that we have. First of all, transient motion of the molten steel and the top interface. So, and this is actually a tricky one because it did not parallelize very well. But we were then successful at getting good behavior on um, uh, simulations with the, the fluid flow, the surface variation, and the argon bubbles, and the electromagnetic breaking all together. The third project is to look at the, tr the capture of the bubbles. And then finally, once we have a model that we understand, we can do parametric studies with it to try to figure out what's the best way to operate the real caster. So here's a mesh, uh, an example of one of the meshes that we're using. We use part of the bottom of that tun dish. We've got the nozzle that goes down into the mold, and that nozzle has bifurcated ports and a bottom. It's a complicated geometry. And we also have the liquid portion of the molten pool in the mold. So we make the boundary condition be the solidification temperature so we don't have to model the solid in this model. We have other models for taking care of the solid. So here's an example of the results of one of, one of these calculations. And as I said, we're interested in the transient behavior. So we can see that our, we've got our flow coming down through the nozzle, it's flowing along, and it's a little bit different from side to side and time to time. So we've got some high speed flow, we've got some slow flow, and the companies would like to understand why do we get these variations. Notice here's our top surface slag layer, and it's pushed up a little bit higher over here, it's a little over there, and this changes with time. On occasion, the flow will come and grab some of the slag and send it down into the molten steel where it can get trapped. So this is really a problem. That's what we'd like to solve. But it's, it doesn't happen that often. And so we need to have quite a long, large time frame in order to simulate these, these relatively rare events. And in fact, 30 seconds is really barely not enough. We, we need many minutes of, of transient simulation to really get the behavior done properly. 
But one of the things we get is the variation of this surface. So this is the interface on the top of the molten steel where it touches the slag layer. Notice um, in between the nozzle, there, there, there's quite a bit of, of a beniscus forming due to the surface tension between the uh, steel and, and the slag and the mold, that, that, a triple point. So we expect to have that. Notice also that we have some time variations. Things are always going up and down a little bit. We'd like to know, um, um, well, first of all, we want to know, does this actually happen in the plant? So we did some measurements of just the surface so we can understand that. And there's our time average uh, line, black line. We've got our measurements, are these points, and there's the, the variation of the measurements. Our instantaneous velocities fit within the variation of the measurements and the average matches. So we're very pleased that this model is quite accurate and can simulate the real process. Of course, our sponsors of the steel companies don't really care about all that. That's just the, what we need as a necessary tool. What they would like is, What's causing their defects? Why is it going with all those variations? And we recently were able to discover this with this simulation that lasted quite a long time. We could look at time periods where, um, here, here's, here's the nozzle from the Tundish. It's got a flow control that goes back and forth up here called a slide gate, and that regulates the flow coming down through the bottom of the nozzle. But it turns out that when the uh, flow coming down through that nozzle is coming down the, the, uh, the open side, then we get kind of a, a, a clockwise flow in the bottom of this nozzle. And, and that ends up giving us a, a very strong surface flow when it's going clockwise like that because the, it's very strong flow down the side. Other times, the jet coming down the nozzle moves to the other side of the nozzle and it comes out counterclockwise. And when it goes counterclockwise, it turns out that the velocity is a lot lower on the top surface. So now we're really understanding why we're getting these surface flow variations. It's because we're getting variations with time and whether the swirl is going one way or it's going the other way. So what we'd like to do, um, people ask me, do you need to include all this geometry like the slide gate in the model? And the answer is it's essential because that's what's causing these variations. So now that we have a bit of an idea of what's going on, we, we, we can try to add on the next step, which is the particles. So here's our argon gas and what the argon gas is doing. And notice I've also got the effect of applying the electromagnetic forces on here. So here's our, our gas coming in and we're modeling actually every single argon bubble and we can do that. It's the most accurate way using this, this uh, um, DPM model. And so most of the gas exits the, the, the top and goes through the slag layer and there's no problem. Um, some of the gas escapes down into the lower part of the caster where it can cause trouble. In this particular case, the electromagnetic field was actually causing things to be worse because it is enabling some of the gas to escape down the side where it can get caught. Looking at the shape of the field, it's because the field did not go all the way across and it enables some of the flow to come down. So details in the shape of the electromagnetic field can, can uh, cause trouble. So we would recommend that you should make the field go all the way across and don't have it weakened towards the edge so that you can make sure that those gas bubbles are not gonna penetrate more deeply. And we also have a, a simulation of where the particles are ending up. And so this is a map of, the, of how the particles are moving, mapped by different size. And then we made some measurements in, some, in, in a slab uh, at, at one of our sponsors, and they got these points for the number of bubbles as a function of distance beneath the strand and the size of those bubbles as a function of distance beneath the strand. And our prediction with our advanced capture criterion actually matches qualitatively with the measurements. And we, we get, it's still not perfect. So um, we would like to do some more with that, but we, it's very encouraging that we're able to um, get a, a, an estimate of how the particles are getting trapped in a real caster. The other thing that we're doing with this is parametric studies to look at the different uh, parameters and magnetic field uh, conditions so that we can um, find ways to lessen these defects in the caster. So just to summarize this, this work, I'd like to um, 
thank the people at uh, Blue Waters again for, for the, the research that we're able to do with this. Um, the um, fluent model shows uh, qu qu quite a speed up breakthrough. We also have good efficiency with our CU flow model. And we've um, had um, a little bit of experience that is uh, a little bit surprising. I can certainly echo some of the things that we heard earlier in the week. Uh, for example, we, we want to uh, beware of what are these changes in architecture that are coming. I feel I'm one of those users who should be afraid because I, I don't understand those things very well, but, but I can recognize they make a difference. One example I can make is that although on some of our runs we can get 3,000 times speed up, if we turn on some of the features of the model, such as the uh, linking between the top surface and the slag layer, one of our algorithms slowed down so much we didn't get any speed up at all. Our lab workstation was actually faster than Blue Waters. So that tells me, well, those simulations we need to do in the lab workstation. But it's, it's very important to pay attention to those little details in how your algorithm works. Make a, a, a huge amount of difference to whether or not you, you, you can get um, good use out of the supercomputer. But finally, um, if we take good high fidelity models, that's the large eddy simulation, um, we couple it with the volume of fluid method, the DPM MHD, then we, we can actually get high resolution predictions that show good agreement with the measurements in the real plant. And now we can predict these multi-physics phenomena, such as interface motion, the movement of bubbles, the entrapment of particles, and most importantly, we can do it fast enough that we can actually do parametric studies to make practical improvements to the plant. Thank you.